history of the English Bible. We want to look at three of the great Bibles and three of the important centuries in that history, beginning with the John Wycliffe and the Wycliffe Bible of the 15th century. It was actually completed in about 1380, but it had a great influence in the next century, in the 15th century. And then the Tyndale Bible of the 16th century and the King James Bible of the 17th century and its influence, of course, has extended even until this very day. We will look at some of the other versions as well, such as the Geneva, but these are the three that we want to focus on. Now, John Wycliffe is the father of the English Bible. He lived from 1324 to 1384, and he gave the English-speaking people the first Bible in our language. It was translated from Latin, and uh, in Wycliffe's day, Rome ruled England and Europe with an iron fist. To illustrate the conditions of that day, uh, we can think of King John II of England and how he was treated by Pope Innocent III about a hundred years before the time of Wycliffe. The King of England had done things that displeased the Pope, so the Pope excommunicated him, and he issued a decree declaring that the people were no longer subject to their own king. Uh, the Pope ordered the King of France to organize an army in order to try to overthrow John. And the Pope also called for a crusade against John. He promised that anyone that would participate would be forgiven of their sins and would have a share in the spoils of war. And so King John of England submitted to the Pope. He pledged complete allegiance to him in all things. He gave England and Ireland into the Pope's hands. Here is the actual oath that John signed in May 15th, 1213. I, John, by the grace of God, King of England and Lord of Ireland, in order to expiate my sins from my own free will and the advice of my barons, give to the Church of Rome, to Pope Innocent and his successors, the Kingdom of England and all other prerogatives of my crown. I will hereafter hold them as the Pope's vassal. I will be faithful to God, to the Church of Rome, to the Pope my master, and to his successors legitimately elected. In those days Rome ruled with an iron hand, and it was forbidden for the Bible to be translated into the languages of the people. Rome allowed the Bible in Latin, but most people of that day did not speak Latin. One of Wycliffe's enemies, Knighton, a canon of Leicester, a Roman Catholic, he complained about the Bible being translated into English. He said to do that would be to lay the Bible open to the laity and to women. He said that would be like casting the gospel pearl under the feet of the swine. And that was the attitude of, of the typical Roman Catholic of that day and certainly of the Pope. Now John Wycliffe was a Roman Catholic priest. He began to preach against some of Rome's errors in his mid-thirties, and throughout his life, he grew in his understanding of the Bible, and increased in his protest against Rome. We don't know a lot about his doctrine. Many of his writings have been destroyed because of the persecutions, but we do know something. We do have some of his writings. He rejected the doctrine that tradition is equal in authority to the Bible, and that's Rome's foundational doctrine. Without that, there's no Roman Catholic Church because there is no Roman Catholic Church in the Bible. Amen. It stands upon traditions. He rejected the doctrine of transubstantiation, that the wafer becomes literally the body and blood of Jesus. He rejected indulgences. He taught that the apostolic churches, the true churches, only had elders and deacons, not popes and archbishops and cardinals and, and such. And he believed, he wrote in his own words, that anything beyond the elders and deacons were introduced by Caesarean pride. He was very bold. Wycliffe was very bold against the Pope. He said, it's blasphemy to call any man the head of the church, save Christ alone. This are, these are a couple of his statements on the Pope. It is supposed, and with much probability, that the Roman pontiff is the great Antichrist. Hank Anacraft says it's foolish to call the Pope the Antichrist. Well, all of the old reformers and Baptists called him the Antichrist. 
That's Hank right. had a graph that's wrong. <laughs> then, John Wycliffe said, How then shall any sinful wretch, who knows not whether he be damned or saved, constrain men to believe that he's the head of a holy church? What bold words. In an hour when you, you'll be burned for saying such words, he said, Antichrist puts many thousand lives in danger for his own wretched life. The Pope. Why? Is he not a fiend stained foul with homicide? Who though a priest fights in such a cause, he's talking about all the wars and violence that the Pope's caused. A fiend stained foul with homicide. How bold. The Pope ruled England in that day, you see. These were very, very bold words. He taught that men have the right to have the Bible in their own languages. This is what he said. You say it is heresy to speak of the Holy Scriptures in English. The Catholics are saying that. You call me a heretic because I have translated the Bible into the common tongue of the people. Do you know whom you blaspheme? Did not the Holy Ghost give the Word of God at first in the mother tongue of the nations to whom it was addressed? That's enough. Why do you speak against the Holy Ghost? You say that the church of God is in danger from this book. How can that be? Is it not from the Bible only that we learn that God has set up such a society as a church? Is it not the Bible that gives the authority to the church? Is it not from the Bible that we learn who is the builder and sovereign of the church? What are the laws by which she is to be governed? The rights and privileges of her members without the Bible? What charter has the church to show for all these? It is you who place the church in jeopardy by hiding the divine warrant, the missive royal of her king for the authority she wields and the faith she enjoins. He said the Bible ought to be in the hands of every person. He taught that men not only have the right to have the Bible, but they have the right to interpret the Bible. He said believers should ascertain for themselves what are the true matters of their faith by having the languages, the scriptures, in a language which all may understand. Oh, by the way, he believed that the Catholic practice of establishing universities and granting masterships and doctorates had been inherited from the heathen and are altogether as, as much use to the church as the devil. I had to throw that in since we're in a university. By the way, I don't ha I'm not a doctor. People call me that, and I don't always stand up in the middle of everything and say, whoop, I'm not, but I'm, I'm not. So I've never earned one, and those that have been offered to me, I, I didn't accept. So. But that's what John Wycliffe believed. Very bold and strong for the Word of God as he saw it and as he grew in his understanding. There's even some evidence that toward the end of his life he rejected infant baptism. This is questionable, but there is some evidence. There's evidence from his own writings. He taught this. These are his words. Baptism doth not confer, but only signifies grace which was before given. Now that entirely destroys the doctrine of infant baptism. The Martyr's Mirror, which was first published in Dutch in 1660, stated that in 1370, John Wycliffe issued an article declaring to militate against infant baptism. The Catholic authorities charged John Wycliffe with denying infant baptism. And we could give quotes from Walden and others. And even if Wycliffe himself never rejected infant baptism, which is possible, it is certain that many of his followers, the Lollards of the 1400s, did reject infant baptism. There were several kinds of Lollards, and some of them were Baptists. John Wycliffe was very bold. John Wycliffe preached against the begging friars of his day that would go around begging uh, 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 for penances from people, the friars, the monks of the Roman Catholic Church, and they were very wicked. This is what John Wycliffe said about them. Friars draw children from Christ's religion into their private order by hypocrisy, lies, and stealing. And thus they are therefore cursed of God as the Pharisees were of Christ. Friars show not to the people their great sins firmly as God biddeth. 
and namely to mighty men of the world, but flatter them and nourish them in sin. Sounds like some fundamental Baptist preachers I know. Also, friars, my friends, most preachers are not this bold today. The vast majority. For without authority of God, they make new religions of errors of sinful men. How bold he was. He was called the morning star of the Reformation. Now there's an interesting connection that I wanted to mention in passing about between Wycliffe and the Waldenses. The Waldenses. Now the Waldenses were Bible-believing Christians who lived in the northern part of Italy and the uh, uh, eastern part of France up in the Alps and from there spread out and sent missionaries out across uh, Europe, most parts of Europe, and even to England. The Martyr's Mirror in uh, 1391 says that uh, in 1391, 443 Waldenses were persecuted in England, a whole large mass of them. And some of them told their inquisitors at the trials that they had been in England for 30 years. And so that goes back to the very middle of when John Wycliffe was in his 30s. And there's very uh, interestingly, or very possibly, a connection between him. These things did not happen, of course, in a vacuum. And it's more common that believers influence others, and that's the way the truth is passed along. The Anglican historian Joseph Milner noted the connection between the Waldensies and Wycliffe. Milner said, this connection between France and England during the whole reign of Edward III was so great that it is by no means improbable that Wycliffe himself first derived his impressions of religion from Raymond Lollard. Now the Lollards that came after Wycliffe very possibly got their name from this Waldensian preacher who was burned at the stake in Cologne in Germany later. And so it very possibly was a connection. The Catholics charged Wycliffe with being a Waldensian, as of course they did anyone that disagreed with them. And the uh, Joshua Thomas in his history of the Baptist in Wales made that possible connection. There were Baptists, ancient Baptists up in the hills there and up in Her Herefordshire, which is where Wycliffe came from. And uh, Joshua Thomas believed that Wycliffe received much of his light in the gospel from those separatist believers. And Friedrich Nolan, in his book, The Inquiry into the Integrity of the Received Text, 1815, makes that connection. And I think it's interesting to think about that. But of course, John Wycliffe had great battles with the Roman Catholic Church, as we can imagine from the doctrine that he held. Wycliffe was first forced to appear before the Catholic bishops in the first half of 1377. 1377 to give an account to them for what he was preaching and, and talk, writing. And uh, the bishops that same year wrote to Gregory, the Pope Gregory XI. Here he is in his chair. Pope Gregory XI. And they told him what Wycliffe was doing. And put, the Pope issued five papal bulls, proclamations, against Wycliffe in that one year. Five of them. And from that point on, to the rest of his life, uh, 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 Wycliffe was hounded by the Catholics, and they made every attempt they could to get their hands on him. But God protected him. Wycliffe was never arrested. He was never put in prison. He was never burned at the stake. And there are some reasons for that, humanly speaking. There was a man who was his protector for many years, named John of Gaunt, Duke of Lancaster. And he was the shield for Wycliffe for many years. He loved old Wycliffe, and he was a powerful man, and he protected him any time they would try to do something against him. Until the end of his life, he did that. And at the very end of his life, just a few years before, Wycliffe came to the conclusion that transubstantiation was a heresy, and that's when John withdrew his protection. But there were others that helped him. There were two queens that helped protect John Wycliffe. Queen Joan. She was the wife of Edward III. He was called the Black Prince because he wore black armor. And he was a warrior and a king. But his wife loved Wycliffe and loved Wycliffe's preaching and protected him. When John Wycliffe was called before the tribunal in 1378, 
called to stand before the bishops and cardinals and give account, and they were getting ready to arrest him and charge him with heresy, Sir Richard Clifford came from the palace and uh, with a message from the queen. And the, in fact, at that point, she was the queen mother. Her son was ruling at that point, uh, Richard II, with a message from her saying, don't mess with Wycliffe. And they didn't at that point. Queen Anne was the wife of Richard II, who followed Edward III. And she also loved Wycliffe and followed in her mother's footsteps, as far or her mother-in-law's footsteps, in loving Wycliffe and what he preached. Now, she was the daughter to uh, uh, the Roman emperor of the Holy Roman Empire, uh, Charles IV, and was the sister of the king of Bohemia. She was brought to England as a teenager, just a teenage girl. But when she came to England, she brought with her some precious books, uh, in, uh, which was the scriptures in German and Bohemian and Latin that she brought with her into England to become Richard II's uh, II wife. And she loved Wycliffe's doctrine. In fact, she had copies of his books. Of course, they had to be handwritten. Copies of those made and then sent back into Bohemia. And there's an association there between revivals that were going on in Bohemia and what was happening in England with a believer sitting as queen on the throne in that day. This godly queen died in 1394, though, at age of 27. But she helped protect Wycliffe. And uh, there was one other thing that happened during Wycliffe's life that pr helped protect him, humanly speaking. And that was a very interesting thing. The, after Gregory XI, the Pope, died, Gregory XII came up into power, sitting on the papal throne. But many of the cardinals were, di uh, didn't like him. And they said, we're going to have another pope. And so they elected Benedict the 13th. And so there were what? Two popes. And this pope cursed this pope. And this pope cursed this pope. And they did that for a long time. Eventually, there were three popes. And they all were cursing one another. And they were so busy cursing one another, they didn't bother with Wycliffe. <laughs> and that's a fact of history. The end of John Wycliffe's life... In 1381, just three years before he died, he finally came to the conclusion that Rome's doctrine of transubstantiation was heresy, and he lost his protector, the Duke of Lancaster, because of that. Wycliffe, at that point, was expelled from his teaching position at Oxford, was forced to go back to his parish of Lutterworth, to the church where he preached. This is the Lutterworth Church, where he was the preacher, and he lived there for the last few years of his life. In th May 1382, Wycliffe was called before yet another tribunal. He, uh, it was called the Blackfriars Synod because it was held in a monastery called Blackfriars in London. But John Wycliffe called it the Earthquake Council because when all the bishops and cardinals and all were seated there, all of a sudden this terrible earthquake shook the city of London and spires fell and stones fell out of castles and everything was shaking and, and Wycliffe called it the judgment of God. He said it's the earthquake council. This, that synod condemned Wycliffe. They charged him with ten heresies and sixteen errors and forbade his writings to be read. The king gave authority at that point to arrest anyone that believed his doctrines. John Wycliffe died in December 1384 at age about 60. There's one more incident I want to note about John Wycliffe's life, though, and that happened after he was dead. In fact, after he was dead almost 44 years. Rome hated Wycliffe. They hated him in his life and hated him in his death. Rome was never ever able to capture Wycliffe and burn him during his life, but they still hated him. And so about 44 years later, they dug up his bones. I don't know how much was left then, but whatever was left, they burned those bones and they threw the ashes into a little river named Swift, which swept down into eventually the Severn River in northern England. And that's how much Rome hated a man that would dare to translate the Bible into the language of the people. Don't let anyone tell you that Rome ever was a friend of the Bible. Now the Wycliffe Bible. Wycliffe Bible, there's a facsimile here that the school has. 
Uh, the Wycliffe Bible was never printed, of course, until much later. Facsimiles were printed, but it was never printed. It was always handwritten at great, uh, with, with great labor, of course, and distributed that way. And uh, it had a great influence, though, even in handwriting copies. The New Testament was finished in 1380, the Old Testament in 1382, only a couple years before he died. And it was revised extensively by a man named John Purvey, who had been taught and was an associate of Wycliffe. And Purvey was an interesting man in his own right. Uh, he was not as strong in some ways as Wycliffe. He was arrested at one point and apparently, so it said, recanted. But he repented of that and he eventually died for his faith. Now this is one thing that John Purvey understood. That the fear of God is required to properly translate the Bible. The fear of God. Here's what John Purvey said about Bible translation. A translator hath great need to study well the sense both before and after. There is interpretation in context. You have to understand the scriptures to, to translate them. And then also he hath need to live a clean life and be full devout in prayers. Now listen to this. And have not his wit occupied about worldly things. I don't know if there's a man alive today that's qualified to translate the Bible. We are so surrounded and so inundated by worldly things. There are pastors that are as crazy about sports as heathens are. See why I don't get invited many places? But it's a fact. And our wits are occupied with worldly things. So much more than and many times, many godly men in the past. But it's required, he said. In 1421, Purvey was arrested a second time for his persistence in preaching the doctrines of John Wycliffe, and he died in prison. We read, in great straits or in great suffering for the faith that he preached in Saltwood Castle. John Wycliffe's translation was translated from the Latin Vulgate. It was not taken from Greek and Hebrew, and it therefore contained mistakes and textual mistakes which are in the Latin Vulgate that Rome had. The most glaring one that I found is the omission of God in 1 Timothy 3.16. The word God is omitted there, and that is a textual error that came down uh, in the Latin even. And so, but it's much closer than the critical text of today. The language of Wycliffe is very simple and forceful, and it laid the foundation, the language did, for the Bibles that were to follow. For example, here is a selection from John 11 from the Wycliffe Bible. Now remember, this is 700 years old. The disciples said to him, Master, now the Jews sought him for to stone thee, and goest thou thither? Jesus answered, Whether there be not twelve hours of the day, if any man wander in the night, he stumblish. For light is not in him. He saith these things, and after these things he saith to him, Lazarus our friend sleepeth, but I go to raise him from the sleep. Therefore his disciples said, Lord, if he sleepeth, he shall be safe. Did you understand that? Probably every word of it. Stumblish, we don't use that, but <clears throat> that's 700 years old. English has not changed as much as most languages have. That's 700 years old. Sure, there are many words that we don't understand in Wycliffe, but the language and the power of it and the simplicity of it and the forcefulness of it. In fact, many phrases that are still in our King James Bible that we use today can be traced all the way back to Wycliffe, such as, straight is the gate and narrow the way. Born again. That's Wycliffe's words. Worship the Father in spirit and truth. The spirit of adoption of sons. A living sacrifice the deep things of God, the cup of blessing which we bless. What fellowship hath light with darkness, Wycliffe wrote. We make known to you the grace of God. Why did sepulchers, he knew who those were, revelation of the mystery, be it far from thee. Despise ye the church of God. The world and all that dwell therein is the Lord's. Who is this king of glory? Those were Wycliffe's words. 
and hundreds and hundreds of others that still remain in our English Bibles today. John Wycliffe, an old warrior for the faith, a bright light in his day. We have much to be thankful for to John Wycliffe. Now we come to the second Bible. The second Bible in the history of the English Bible that we want to deal with this morning. And this is the name of William Tyndale. William Tyndale lived from 1494 to 1536. Very, very important man. William Tyndale. He was the first to translate the Bible into English from the Greek and the Hebrew. His was the first Bible that was printed in the English language. His is the most important name in the history of the English Bible and one of the most important names in the history of the English people, period. When Tyndale was born, England was still greatly bowed down by Rome as it was during the days of Wycliffe more than a hundred years before. Rome was the state religion of England. The citizens were largely given over to idolatry and honoring the mass as the wafer is God, and worshiping that little wafer. Catholic images and famous shrines of Mary were pilgrimage sites and people would flock to these sites such as Our Lady of Walsingham and St. Anne of Buxom and people would flock there and, and, and worship these idols of Mary. The Catholic priests controlled the people's lives from cradle to grave. People were very immoral because their religious leaders were immoral. The Catholic priests kept prostitutes and brothels in London for themselves. And therefore the moral state of the people was degraded beyond conception almost. Ignorance and vice and immorality of the worst sort reigned almost universally in England when William Tyndale was born in the early 1500s. There were laws that forbade the printing or the translation of the, uh, of the scriptures into English. Heretics had been burned at the stake since 1401, and those were the times in which Tyndale was born. When Tyndale's day, the popes of Rome were very powerful and very wicked. Sixtus IV, who lived or reigned from 1471 to 1484, established houses of prostitution in Rome. Innocent VIII, who reigned from 1484 to 1492, had seven illegitimate children by whom he and, and, and he enriched those children from the treasuries of the Catholic Church and made them rich. Alexander VI, who reigned from 1492 to 1503, he lived with a Spanish lady and her daughter. He had all kinds of children. He had five children. His favorite son, Caesar Borgia, very infamous name in church history, murdered his brother and murdered his own brother-in-law. They had orgies in the palace in, in Rome that were beyond uh, uh, description. Just a few years before Tyndale was born, work was begun on the St. Peter's Basilica and parts of the 1,000-room Vatican Palace under the reign of Pope Nicholas V. Tyndale was also born into a time of great change. When he was eight years old, Columbus discovered America. When Tyndale was 14, Vasto da Gama sailed around the Cape of Good Hope to India, and the great era of world exploration had begun. It's a time of great change, an exciting time. Also a very, very, very difficult time for Bible believers. Just three years before Tyndale was born, the Spanish Inquisition was established. And by the time Tyndale was only 15 years old, a teenager, more, almost 9,000 had been burned to death. In Spain alone, 90,000 imprisoned under the Inquisitor General in Spain. And the Inquisition was raging. Persecutions were being poured out upon the Waldensians. Horrible, terrible, unspeakable persecutions that have been described in eyewitness reports in several books, including Fox's Book of Martyrs. The Waldensian Christians of Bohemia and Moravia. When Tyndale was only four years old, the Pope sent an army of 18,000 Catholics to make war against the Waldensians up in northern Italy, 
And that army, those armies came in and destroyed their villages and destroyed their towns and, and did unspeakable things to those people. Here's a couple of the old pictures drawn by eyewitnesses that are in old church history books. Cutting babies, splitting them in half as the mothers watched. Throwing them into the fires, many at a time. And those are just a couple of things that we can even mention that they did to those Bible-believing Christians when Wick Tyndale was just a young man and growing up. But the most important change of all that occurred in Wycliffe's time was the printing press. Of course, in Europe, the man named Gutenberg, John Gutenberg, had invented movable type in Europe, and had the printing press began to grow in prominence. And by the time that Tyndale was born, there were hundreds of printing presses out across Europe, and there were one or two even in England. England was behind the times in those days as far as printing. And so William Tyndale, his times, will take a short break and then continue with Tyndale's life just in a few minutes.